Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Well, today we are concluding our celebration of Bob Bailey at 110 with another newly circulated episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is June the 1st of 1958, and the title is The Froward Fisherman Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Clark Sources, Mr. Dollar, Continental Insurance and Trust Company, Fort Wayne, Indiana. What can I do for you, sir? If you have time, I wish you'd come out here and see me. Mind telling me what it's all about? Well, as I understand it, you're quite a fisherman. Well, I like to think so. That you've fished all over the country at one time or another. Not as much as I like, but now what's on your mind? Tell me, in the course of your travels, have you ever run across a client of mine named Bertram R. Hallsworthy? No, I can't say that I have. He a fisherman, too? That's all he's done for the last 10 or 15 years. Good man. Is he looking for a fishing pal? His wife has just filed a claim against his life insurance policy. $160,000. Oh, died, huh? Disappeared, Mr. Dollar. Think you might be able to find him for us. I think I could try. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance and Trust Company, Fort Wayne, Indiana office. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the forward fisherman matter. Expense account item one, 4680, transportation to New York, then a main liner to Fort Wayne. Item two, 470, taxi from Bearfield into Continental's office on Calhoun Street, where Thorson's got right to the point. Bertram Hallsworthy and his wife lived in Angola, Mr. Dollar, or rather just above it on Lake James. Oh, yeah, that's north of here, isn't it? Yes, about 45 miles or so. He'd made a lot of money in his younger days. He invented a lot of things, too, mostly in the line of fishing tackle. Say, wait, isn't he the man who invented that fast-strike minnow hook? No, that was somebody out on the West Coast. Uh, I use that hook myself. Anyhow, when he retired, it was to spend all of his time fishing. That's why he bought the place on Lake James. But now you say he's disappeared. Yes. When? Well, all I know is what I've learned from his wife, and that isn't much. He took off one day last February and headed down to Florida to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Alone? Alone. His wife doesn't care for the sport the way he does. Doesn't care for it at all. Unfortunately, I find that's true of a lot of wives. Yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, then you're married, too. Oh, no, sir, I told you I'm a fisherman. But go on. Well, then, in April, he showed up at home again. Very briefly, just for a few hours. Then took off again. That's the last we know of him. And that's all you know? Yes. The police have done a lot of legwork, checked out a lot of possibilities and so on, but have got nowhere. Then why don't I head on up there and see his wife? Unless you have a better idea. I wish I had. Item three, fifty dollars, deposit on a rental car. I headed north through Garrett, Auburn, and Waterloo. When I reached Angola, I stopped at a mobile gas station across from the campus of Tri-State College to ask directions. The attendant knew all about the halls where they placed on Lake James. I could see why when I got there a few minutes later. It was a beautiful big lodge built of native logs, sitting about a hundred feet above the water's edge with its own private dock poking out into the calm blue lake. As I stood there on the broad screen porch, a big fish jumped clear off of the water. A pike, probably. Or maybe... Yes? What is it? I didn't hear you ring. Oh, excuse me. I I was admiring your beautiful view of the lake. I suppose it's beautiful to some people. What is it you want? Mrs. Hallsworthy? That's right. I'm Mrs. Hallsworthy. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, you some news about my husband? No, ma'am. I'm afraid I haven't. Well, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. So, the insurance company man and the police, all I know, but I suppose I may as well tell you, too. Sit down. Thanks. But I'm convinced now that Bertram's dead. Where, I don't know. But I'm certain I would have heard from him long before this, he was still alive. 
Is that your only reason for believing him dead? Isn't that sufficient? Well, I don't know. That's because you never knew Bertram, nor me. Bertram loved to fish, so why, I'll never know. Once our family grew up and got married and he retired, that's all he cared about. As I understand it, he left here sometime in February. And he went to Florida, to Sarasota, Florida. For some reason or other, he seemed to prefer the salt water fishing. Oh, in spite of settling here on Lake Jane? That's right. The only reason we didn't buy somewhere on the coast is because I wouldn't put up with the dampness and mess. I've yet to find a place on the ocean where all the fishy drags into the house don't smell so. Lord knows this place is bad enough with all the mosquitoes and bugs during the summer and the birds and the frogs croaking all night. I, uh, I take it you and your husband haven't been too happy together recently. We haven't. That's why I'm not sitting around moping and moaning and weeping over his passing. And you have no idea what might have happened to him? No. That is. Yes? Well, well, that is, unless he got drowned or something like that on one of his silly fishing expeditions. Or unless someone found out how much money he was carrying and killed him for that. He took a great deal of money with him? Yes, he always did. How much, Mrs. Alford? He never told me. But it was thousands of dollars, you may be sure of that. He left here in February? Yes. The weather was too cold in Florida. Too cold all along the Atlantic coast. At least that's what he said in his regular weekly postcard. So he tried up in Alabama and then Tennessee and then Kentucky and then heaven knows where. Then in April, he'd come back here. How long he was here, I don't know. I was in Fort Wayne for a few days. Then how do you know he was here at all? He moved one of the chairs in the living room to get to the floor safe, to get some more money to waste on fishing. Well, how do you know he was going fishing again? Because of the note he left in the big freezer with the fish he brought back to put into it. Oh. Uh, may I see that note? I don't know why not. If the missing persons bureau down in Fort Wayne are willing to show it to you. Oh, I see. And you're sure your husband left no clue as to where he was going? I'm very sure. Mr. Dollar. Yes? My husband is dead. If he weren't, I would have heard from him. You're doing nothing but wasting your time here. My time. I've told everything I know to the police over and over again. If you think you can accomplish more than they have, why don't you go down there and talk with Lieutenant Bascom? Maybe I'd better. Funny, she didn't seem too concerned about her husband's disappearance. And obviously, she had a lot to gain by his death, his property, whatever money was lying around, and there must be plenty, and a big hunk of insurance. Sure, maybe a talk with the police would do some good, so I left. But you know something? I unknowingly left behind me the one big fat clue to the whole situation. This is Bertram Hallsworthy. There at the lodge on Lake James, Indiana, had given me no clues at all as to the whereabouts of a missing husband. Lieutenant Bascom at the Bureau of Missing Persons in Fort Wayne was some help, but not very much. Johnny, we even put out calls to every place that old Hallsworthy was ever known to go fishing. And believe me, that covers a lot of territory. He's done nothing else for the last 10 or 15 years, and he's been all over this end of the United States. His wife said he left some kind of a note, Lieutenant. Well, here's a note right here. Oh, thanks. Be home again one of these days, maybe. Meantime, I'm going back to get some more of these beauties. That means the fish he left in the freezer up at the lodge. As usual, you'll be happier with me away. And you know something, Martha? So will I. Signed, Bert. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Yeah? What kind of fish did he need in that freezer? Well, I didn't recognize him, but Hal Warren, who used to pound the beat back in Jersey City, did. Uh, and what are they? Striped bass. He co- oh, uh, striped bass. Said he used to catch them along the Jersey Shore. So we blanketed the whole Jersey coast with pictures, description, license number of his car, description on the car, everything we had on old Hallsworth. Yeah, but wait a minute. Those fish are found on the coast of New York, yeah, New England, the whole Yeah, coast. yeah, I know. Down the whole South Atlantic coast, too. But if you've ever fished the Atlantic coast... I have, a lot. Then you ought to know what the cops back there kept shoving down our throats. What's that? Sure, it's striper country, all of it. But not this time of year. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, now listen. I think I know what you're going to say. Sure, you're going to jump to the same conclusion I did. 
That with the way they haven't been getting along, with all she has to gain if he's put out of the way... It is a possibility. As for this note... Yeah, it's his handwriting, all right. Check. But it could have been written any time in the last 15 years about any kind of fish. So it all adds up, doesn't it? She knocked him off. Nobody else in town saw him around when he was supposed to be here in April. So she may have done it any time since he left in February. So was supposed to left. All of which can't be proved, however, until you find his body. Plus proof that she did it. Make it a lot easier for us if she did. Wait a minute. I'll tell you where those fish could have come from and this time of year. The Pacific Coast. Uh, they're in Atlantic fish, those diapers, exclusively. No, no, not anymore. Some years ago, a bunch of them were shipped live from Tom's River, New Jersey, to up around San Francisco, the Sacramento River. Oh, no. Sure. And now, up in Northern California, they're one of the best game fish they have. Oh, brother, that means I start all over again. That's right, Bastard. Maybe I better stick to the theory that she did it and buried his body somewhere around here. Now, look, get on the teletype to the police on the West Coast. I'll check back with you. Meantime... I'm going to see what I can find out about her. In the next three days, I think I talked to everybody in northern Indiana. Anybody who could possibly know or have contact with a Hallsworth. Sure, it was pretty admitted that she and her husband didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. But nowhere did I find any reason at all for suspecting she might have done him in. I talked to friends, neighbors, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. Shopkeepers, businessmen, bankers, nothing. Then... Finally, it was the old family lawyer who gave me a priceless piece of information. Too long to permit you to even tolerate the thought such a thing could have happened. Well, I should strike you down for suggesting such a possibility, Mr. Dollar. Well, sir, I'm sorry, but after all... Granted, you... he was a, a froward sort of man, even in his fishing. Froward? Yes. Yes, that's a good description of him in recent years. Froward. Now, maybe it's her fault, but that does not in any way whatsoever imply that anything you might do or say could possibly cause that fine woman to... Wait a minute. One word. That one word held the key to the whole matter. Well, even in a city. But I didn't realize it then. Even if I had, it probably wouldn't have meant anything. That is, until I got a break the following day. The kind that comes once in a lifetime. Let's lay some cards on the table. An investigator is assigned to a case. The case gets solved, so he takes the credit, whether he deserves it or not. Happens all the time. But this is one time I have to admit I deserve no credit at all. Except, perhaps, for just being around. All right. After checking up on Martha Hallsworthy, I was convinced she didn't kill her husband. The fact remained he was still unaccounted for. And strangely enough, the only clue as to where he might have gone was a couple of fish, private bass, left in the freezer at his lakeside lodge in Angola, Indiana. All right. I went back to the missing persons bureau in Fort Wayne to Lieutenant Bassett. Sorry, Johnny, but the police on the West Coast gave us nothing. And they're a thorough bunch, too. If Hallsworthy or his car had showed up out there anywhere out there, they'd have had a lead for us. But they haven't. Nothing. And those two lousy fish are still our only clue. That's something else, Johnny. What? Stripers haven't been running out on the West Coast either the last couple of months. Well, he must have got them somewhere and brought them back. Brought... Lieutenant. What? Is there any way of knowing how long the fish have been in that freezer? Mrs. H says her husband dropped them off in April. Wait, you, you think maybe he caught them a long time ago, that they've been there ever since? But, Johnny, that would only incriminate her. I know. And you just finished saying... I know, I know. Now, listen. Is there anybody around who could tell us how long they've been in that freezer? Well, I guess one of the professors at the university, you know, science department, biology, something like that, uh, Professor Kendall. Come on. Huh? We'll drag him up to the lodge and have him take a look. Oh, whatever you say. Come Johnny. on. Then came the stroke of luck I mentioned earlier. Just pure dumb luck. As Lieutenant Bascom and I were about to step into my car, an old truck with a camper's body and a boat on the trailer behind it pulled up to a stop. Uh, excuse me, officer. Can you tell me... Johnny. Emmett! Emmett Gowan, world-famous writer of fishing yarns and articles who spent his whole life touring the country, fishing, then writing about it. Emmett, you old son of a gun. How are you? Oh, just great, Johnny. You remember my wife, Claire? Yeah. How are you, Johnny? Sure, Claire. How are you? Emmett, what are you doing around here? Uh, looking for a place called Lake James. Ooh, don't mention it. I uh, want to do an article about it for one of the... 
Okay, why don't you come along? Hey, listen, listen. Did you ever run across an old character by the name of Bertram Hallsworthy? Sure, here and there, all over the country. When? Oh, last time was early last winter. Oh. Yeah, funny old coot. Good fisherman, but a real character. How do you mean? Oh, you know, perverse, contrary, obstinate. Forward. Huh? Uh, go on, Emmett. Well, you know, a real nonconformist. Oh, that's what it means. That place used live bait, he used plugs. Sold in water, he used a fly rod. A man who'd want to catch private bass when there aren't none. Striper. Yes. Hey, listen, Johnny. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to tell you something about those old saltwater devils you may not believe, but so help me. I hopped into my rental car and took off. I went south on Route 31, then east into Ohio. I swung south on 25 to Knoxville, Tennessee, and then east on 70, south on 16, and I finally reached Columbia, South Carolina. Then east again to a freshwater lake, Lake Moultrie, nearly 100 miles inland from the ocean. On the expense account, this item, $431 even. And my luck still held. It was almost dusk when I pulled up at the dock of a fishing camp at the west end of the lake. Climbing out of his boat was a grizzled old-timer with a string of fish that made my eyes pop out. One of them must have been close to 30 pounds. This was a man I wanted to talk to, or rather listen to. And I did, back in his cabin over a glass of bourbon. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. I don't understand how these striped bass got into this freshwater lake any more than anybody else does. Even the fish and game people. Stripers and freshwater. Yes, sir. And only here in Moultrie and, and over in Lake Marion. Oh, they tried planting them in other lakes, but nothing happened. They don't reproduce. <laughs> and I thought I knew a lot about this. Oh, I couldn't believe it myself when I stumbled onto it. Impossible, it says. But here they are. <laughs> Lunky, too. But sooner or later, every Tom, Dick, and Harry that owns a fishing pole is going to find out about it. And that's when I'll move along. Why? Well, I guess I'm just a contrary old cuss. Like to do things a little bit different. So when everybody else comes in, well, I'll be doing something different. Forward. But meantime, I'm going to... What was that word you said? Forward. The forward fisherman. <laughs> Sounds like a lawyer I know back in... in when are you going to go back home, Mr. Hallsworthy? Now, how did you... Ever... Well, well, I figured this way. My wife, Martha, has been henpecking me a mite too long about all the time I spend fishing. And I figured that maybe if I worry her a little bit about what maybe happened to me, maybe she'd be a mite more tolerant. And I hate to admit this, I really do. Really. If she will, maybe... Maybe I could be a little more tolerant, too. <laughs> and then maybe we'd be happy again. Like we used to be. Yeah. Maybe so. I hope so. I don't know. Life is really funny sometimes. Old man Hallsworthy did stay away a while longer... And when he went home, his wife must have seen the light. Because, believe it or not, a couple of weeks ago, I saw her picture in the Fisherman magazine. She was holding up a nine-pound pike she had caught in Lake James. Expense account total, $181 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Welcome back. Once again, uh, we don't have the closing credits, but again, we'll refer to John Abbott, who uh, read the scripts in California, and the writer was Jack Johnstone, with a cast of Byron Kane, Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Will Wright, Forrest Lewis, and Howard McNear. This episode is honestly one of my favorite of the self-contained Yours Truly Johnny Dollar episodes with Bob Bailey. The acting is solid, of course. The subject is well-researched. You get a sense with some episodes that something is just superficially looked into, but John Stone had established Johnny as an expert fisherman, 
by this point in the series, so he knew that he needed to make it sound really true to life. And I suspect Johnstone was also pretty big into fishing. The striped bass are an interesting plot point, although today Mr. Holsworthy would find it hard to express his frowardness by fishing for striped bass in fresh water. They can actually be found at numerous fresh freshwater lakes throughout the United States because they're not just good for recreational fishing, they also help to control uh, populations of gizzard shad. In fact, I suppose that given the way these episodes are listened to, a listener who heard this episode might have just caught a striped bass on Lake Thunderboard in Illinois and have no idea that he might have been being froward. This episode also shows how Jack Johnstone was a master of continuity in an era when it was mostly non-existent in adult detective dramas. The character of Emmett Gowan would be used again four years later during the Mandel Kramer era. Again, I... I'm indebted to John Abbott's Who Is Johnny Dollar Matter for that little tidbit. And to top it all off, we get a Howard McNear performance, which is always good in this era. And in just a few seconds, with just a few lines, he really connects and makes his character sympathetic. And you can understand his behavior. Now, scaring your spouse is never a good idea, but you can understand from the story that there's a dysfunction that went both ways. She henpecked him during the years that he was running his business and raising his kids, and he essentially said, I'm done. I'm going to go fishing, and you can come with me or not. And so he spent 15 years not from the story anyway, being immoral, but trying to do things in the way that they shouldn't typically be done because he was tired of always being told what he had to do. But just being contrary rarely brings happiness. And I think the way that Johnny asked, when are you going home, really did strike a nerve. And so he was ready to go home and find a way so that they could work together, compromise, and find a way to live together and be happy again. And it's such an interesting emotional through line. It's told a bit through reading between the lines, but considering that you only have 18 minutes for the drama portion including the mystery and all the fishery research. And this is just such a neat bit of writing in terms of being able to pull things all together. Now, they did have to summarize some stuff a little quickly, but again, you only had 18 minutes for the drama, so I give it a pass on that. This was just really solid acting and solid writing, so I hope you enjoyed it. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Scott, Patreon supporter since June of 2016, currently supporting the program at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. We also have an episode of Public Domain Video Theater that's out today. You can check that out over at uh, videotheater.greatdetectives.net or on our YouTube channel at youtube.greatdetectives.net. Tomorrow, we return to our regular lineup with an episode of Sam Spade where... Uh, My name's Penny Brewster, and I I hope I can tell you the story before Grandfather comes to the phone. The story? Yes, you see. Oh, here he comes. Play along with him, Mr. Spade, please. And remember, you're not Sam Spade, the detective. You're Marshall Spade of the California Rangers. Marshall? Wait a minute. I... I... And you must look the part. In a blue serge suit? You'll think of something. I know you will. I've heard private detectives are terribly clever. Well, I... I... Marshall Spade? That's right. Buck Brewster talking. Yeah? And he says you're the straightest shooting pokey since Billy the Kid. See, Rex? Huh? 
Oh, oh, sure, sure. T-Rex, Buck. T-Rex. Same as you and the horse fly along like you was one. T-Rex? Buck, at one time or another, I've taken a flyer on every nag in the game. Trotters included. Then you're my man, Marshal. Get up here fast. This shooting's liable to start any minute. <laughs> we we have a bad connection on this phone. I thought you said the shooting's liable to start. I ain't got no time to waste on useless palaver, Spade. Just get up here. I'll paint the whole picture when I see you. Get up where? Where are you? Why, in Dry Gulch. Where else would I be? Well, that's... Well, where is Dry Gulch? Take the main trail north out of town till you spot the Oak Circle. Then bear right. Yeah? I'll go down now and leave a change of mount to the circle. Uh, how far would you say this circle is from San Fran? Oh, about a half day's hard ride, I reckon. Half a day's hard... Uh, look, Buck, I, I don't think I better. I'm out of condition, you know. I haven't been riding lately. Oh, I... sure, that ain't what my purdy granddaughter tells me. Purdy, eh? Half a day's hard ride. About 20 miles, huh? I don't remember any town along there. Don't worry about the town, Marshal. It's here. Just get in your saddle and get to loping. You're sure there's a time there? Please, I ain't got time to argue geography with you. Now listen. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.